What's happening, folks? Back to do a Bad Religion documentary watch-along, and indeed it's sort of a concert too. This is a documentary called Along the Way. Many people will know it's one of their more famous early songs. I have it on the compilation 8085, as I think a lot of people do. But yeah, ultimately it's from their 1989 tour in support of the Suffer album, 1988. I've mentioned this before, and many people who follow them will know. Suffer is the album when they sort of re... Um, coalesced they got back together after they had split for a few years uh and again greg went to i think uh college and um began his grad school work and i think the other guys were um i know bentley went over to tsol for a while so yeah essentially 88 they come back together and they make one of the best punk rock albums i'm familiar with and ultimately uh while they were touring and again in 89 they're writing the album uh, no Control, which may just be my favorite Bad Religion album. So this is from like an incredibly fruitful and you know critically acclaimed period in the band's history, even if, again, I like all their stuff right up into Age of Unreason, uh, which is the most recent album. But yeah, I have a few Bad Religion documentaries. One of them I actually lost. It's called The Riot. It's not really a riot. It's uh, And it's essentially, it's just a concert. It's not even so much a documentary. But I had it on VHS. I lost it. Great friend of the channel, Paulie, sent me a replacement copy. Shout out to you. Uh, I also have one, I think, in on the tour in support of their The Empire Strikes First album, like 05. And it's like live at the Hollywood Bowl, something like that. But this one I always enjoyed, again, because it's from maybe my favorite period of the band creatively. And I don't know, there's a, there's some interviews with the guys along the way, and ultimately, uh, I probably will keep saying that, but the the concert footage is taken from, I think, 12 different concerts, or like, it takes place over the course of 12 different cities while they're on this tour. And again, we get some interviews with the individual guys, and uh, you know, I'll have more to say as we go through each of them. But ultimately, again, it's one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, always a contender for one of my favorite punk bands, along with a handful of others. Many people know I'm a big Subhumans fan, and indeed, I have a Subhumans live DVD that we'll go through at some point. So, in any case, let's start it. This is from 1989, an independent film documentary about bad religion called Along the Way. Yeah, like if you think that, you know, music videos for, you know, pop music and major labels look kind of dated and so on in the late 80s, just wait till you see like the punk rock world in the late 80s, which, you know, in some ways was trying to branch out a little bit and music videos and whatnot. But yeah, it was obviously on a lower level of technological uh, quality. Something like that. on yet? Well, uh, it's been about uh, one week since we came to Germany, and I recognize most of your faces, and you're so close I can almost touch most of you. But for those of you who don't know, we are Bad Religion, and you are Brayman. I love Bad Religion. Uh, let me see. Sorry. I think I can turn this up a tiny bit more. Okay.
So I sort of forgot. They're clearly splicing footage from the different shows, but you know they'll do it for each of the songs, no doubt. I'd just like to point out in Southern California here, all music loving people are welcome in my home. They really should be getting better ovations for these songs. God damn, life as a touring punk drummer, like you gotta like just be ripped. Like you never have to go to the gym, you're just ripped anyway. Sorry, that probably made a loud sound. I hit the microphone with my teacup. I apologize. Number one, I think there's a couple ad libs here, and number two, like his vocal delivery, he's going above and beyond the album track.
Well, I think we've got about four or five more shows left in Germany. Until then, it seems like we're, uh, we're doing time here in Germany. I think he had his University of Madison, Wisconsin uh, shirt on there. Bad Religion stuff really has a distinct sound. I like, I'm sort of waiting to comment on all the guys and sort of their stage demeanor and so on, just because again, we're going to get some interviews. So I'm holding off, but uh, I do have stuff to say.
Dying, it's just your destiny. Thank you very much. Okay. We hear that a lot of you have been uh, buying the album Suffer here. So here's one off of it. You can, you can count along with us. How's that? That's, this one is called The Numbers Game. It's superficial progress, they call it liberation Well, be a touch to the car, big brother seems to rule the nation One nation under God, we stand above the rest With my eye technology, we're never second best Our penalty is infiltration So bring your mind with their own age and victory to domination There was a woman here on the left who was actually singing the words. I feel like, you know, a lot of punk concerts, um, you'll see people singing along. This show, it feels like less so. And again, they're, you know, they're a recently reformed group. Um, ultimately, they're touring this album, so maybe not everyone really knows it, but shout out to her over here on the left. So back and I took the one nation victory to domination. Thank you. I mean, all these lines, avarice has led us across the ocean. It's just like, they're songwriting, man. I finally come to realize that something has become a divide. How much is enough to kill yourself? That quantity is no today. As we blow ourselves away. Tell me, is there anything so sure?
What are you doing except playing in bad religion? Um, well, when I'm at home, I... Brett Gurwitz, Mr. Brett, one of the two main songwriters and founders of the band and the label boss of Epitaph, the label initially set up to release their material and which, you know, eventually became a huge label in the punk world through a couple releases in particular um i believe offspring smash is the one that really just like put uh their business on another level and ultimately you know i won't dwell on this but in a few years from here he ends up taking time away from bad religion to focus on epitaph and also to kind of sober up i think um you know he's one of those like experimental you know he was trying to um uh, explore mental concepts and so on. Like you'll hear when he talks, he's definitely someone who's uh, into a creative process and so on. But yeah, uh, it feels like at this point you can kind of tell that he's not all that far away from just having to take some time away and so on. That was my impression. I remember when I first saw this interview. Uh, but again, I mentioned before, like to me, Bad Religion, it has to be both Greg and Brett. So. Um, I was bummed out when he left the group, and I was very excited when he came back for uh, the process of belief. So, yeah, but this is Brett at uh, in 1989. Yeah, I'm working in music, but not. Um, we don't do bad religion all the time. I have a. Uh, I have a recording studio, and uh, I. Um, record records and occasionally I produce records. Sometimes I just engineer them. And um, also on the other half of the time I have Epitaph Records. What's your job? Work on motorcycles for uh, the motion picture. Jay Bentley, bassist, again longtime member of the band. Uh, when they sort of went separate ways in the mid 80s, he moved over briefly to True Sounds of Liberty, uh, and then eventually, I think there was another group he was in, and then found his way back to Bad Religion when they reconvened. For like uh, when you see in the movie when the guy crashes on the bicycle, on the motorbike when the guy crashes, then when they cut on the scene, I go in and, and put the bike back together so they can ride it again. Um, I just graduated from school and as of now I'm uh... I, I the whole time I've been trying to remember his name they like the one part of the band that has been somewhat of a rotating door is the drummer position it was originally I want to say Bobby Scher was the first drummer and um, like Brooks Wackerman came in a few years later like after this um, they now have a drummer who I think is known primarily for playing in metal bands before this, but I'm blanking on this guy's name. I feel bad. Part-time teacher at school, at um, college, and when I get back, I'm going to have to try to find uh, a real job. Uh, I, I play Nintendo. Greg Hetson, who eventually would be very bald, so I was like amused, and I'm watching him rock out during the concert footage, and his hair is, you know, flopping around. And my television set, and you have Nintendo here, right? Of course, you know Super Mario Brothers, Nintendo. There are games that you play on your TV set. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, it's a little, little computer game you hook up to your TV set, Super Mario Brothers. Uh, Blades of Steel, it's a hockey game. So I sit at home and... I apologize, one second. I just need to feed Luca briefly. Okay, Luca is fed. And I should mention, um, not only did I remember the drummer's name, I think it's Pete Finestone is the name, uh, but I should add that Mr. Hetson here uh, is also of the Circle Jerks, and I believe he joined the group shortly before they started recording for Suffer. Hey, brothers. I play Nintendo and my television set. And you have Nintendo here, right? Of course. You know, Super Mario Brothers, Nintendo. There are games that you play on your TV set. Oh. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a little, little computer game you hook up to your TV set. Super Mario Brothers, uh, Blades of Steel, it's a hockey game. So I sit at home and. It's a pretty. Pretty mediocre hockey game. I had it as a kid. Uh, but I love Greg just sort of like trying to steer the interview in a funny direction. And the guy's just like holding his mic and like, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. Play games on my TV set. Go to shows. I'm a graduate student at UCLA. 
and uh, I'm getting a master's degree and a PhD eventually. And um, I, the way I make a living, I guess, is uh, while I'm at the university, I teach undergraduate students uh, laboratory courses in biology. I was not a biologist, nor did I work in a laboratory. But when I was a grad student, I worked as a teaching assistant for a couple of different professors and uh, did some lectures and outside tutoring sessions for undergraduate students. So in a way, I was kind of like that. But again, my, I was in history and um, anthropology, so it wasn't quite the same. Is singing in bad religion also a kind <laughs> of teaching for you? That's so funny, the way he, like, affirmatively gestured like three different ways. I teach undergraduate students uh, laboratory courses in biology. Is singing in bad religion also a kind of teaching for you? Yeah, in a sense uh, I get the same benefits out of, uh, <clears throat> for instance, coming to Europe or anywhere in the world actually, uh, where I go and people have heard bad religion and have looked at the lyrics songs that I have written uh, and actually taken them to thought, um, that's a rewarding feeling. It's sort of the same kind of feeling I get uh, when I teach in a classroom and at the end of the semester a student tells me, you know, I really learned a lot from your teachings. Because people tell me I learned a lot from uh, your music too. Interestingly though, <clears throat> so well, so I get the same benefits or the same good feeling from uh, people who like bad religion and students who like my teaching. But interestingly, the, very rarely do the two ever mix. <laughs> I, I'll never be too old to play music because I enjoy music, all different types of music I play. And I enjoy listening. And Punk rock is sort of uh, what we as a band play the best. We play punk rock better than anything else. And sort of a reference there to Into the Unknown, you know, went into the prog rock style, brought in some keyboards. Eventually, you know, it was decided, nope, that's not what we're doing. And um, again, they took a break for a while. So, yeah, I feel like embedded within that comment is the the at or the reality that they did actually try a different style for a year or so. If we can, as long as my heart and my throat keeps up. I think there's no reason that I shouldn't be able to play this type of music. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the uh, crowds. It's crazy, like, they're still around, and although, like, you know, the way they play, like, Brett only plays when they're in the L.A. area, and I do believe he contributes, you know, songs and guitar parts to the albums, but, um, yeah, like, it's crazy to know that, like, so many years later, they're still around, but, you know, obviously it's not identical. You know, maybe the crowds will become more peaceful, more not, a, you know what happens with age. When you get older, you tend to slow down a little. But there will probably always be that new generation of younger uh, kids who are into it, who bring the spark and the fire. But I don't want to look to, I don't want to get to the point where I'm, where I start losing more hair and get fat and where it's just an embarrassment to be up on stage. I don't want to get to that point. And hopefully someone will be <laughs> kind enough to tell me when I'm, <laughs> I've reached that point. This one is called Along the Way. Through the 
I feel like that chorus in Pretty Well Greg's getting attacked. <laughs> he literally, a uh, guy is trying to like, I guess party with him, but like basically tackling him on stage. But that line, the chorus, the, um, you know, die like a champion, yeah, hey, uh, go to hell with Superman. The I feel like that line, I remember like even friends of mine who didn't really listen to Bad Religion, they knew that line and they'd occasionally like reference it. <laughs> I absolutely love this song. Probably my favorite, like, a contender for my favorite song on the entire 8085 compilation, which, um, you know, includes their first and third albums and a couple, like, EPs and so on. There's a lot of material on there. Um, but yeah, this is one of my favorites, which has a, you know, a very intense title. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I love Greg going into that like yo ho like they're you know dancing kind of like pirates like drunk pirates it's so funny You know, it just occurred to me, like the, I, for, I think I mix up the song names. There's a song that I also love a lot called Eat Your Dog, uh, but I, it's, that's not the, that's not this song. <laughs> Yeah, this is faith in God. That's why I got that video on you. And people that are one today, they say that Jewish Christians shut their own fucking fools. Not trying to get me away. Let's make money and take it like the only damn in hell. Don't be like all them. Yeah, I'm your faithful thought of choices. Use them, don't let them use you. It's all right, do everything I know. How many of you are? But seriously, both of those tunes, uh, Faith in God and Eat Your Dog, are uh, two of my favorites from like the whole first like five year period of the group. He looks a little like Va Rude Van Nistelrooy there. Um, but it's funny, like, again, his demeanor in the shows, it's amusing. Like, he, it's like he's sort of like, you know, thinking and speaking like a, you know, guy on kind of a mountaintop rambling to himself, the way he kind of, he's looking around and gesturing in ways that speak to some of the song lyrics. But yeah, like he's a bit less like intense, you know, frenetic and crazy compared to some other punk singers, but you could tell he's like feeling the lyrics when he, when he gives them. Uh, older than the 
fourth grade in 1982. I don't even think I was in kindergarten yet. What time? When do you start kindergarten? 82, I was one slash two years old. So, yeah, unfortunately, I was not yet in the fourth grade. 82, a very good year. Got a lot of young people. This one is from an album we released called How Could Hell Be Any Worse? And this one started that one off. It's called We're Only Gonna Die From Our Own Arrogance. Not only one of their signature songs like throughout their entire career, but I it got even more attention when Sublime, who was then sort of like, you know, very popular both in, you know, sort of ska slash punk circles, but by then sort of mainstream circles, they covered it. Uh, and again, I think it got like renewed attention. Again, another like favorite from the entire 8085 compilation, and uh, one that really lets uh, Bentley show off his bass prowess. But yeah, part three, man. Second 
Nein, Nils aus Sieke muss mal unbedingt ins Büro kommen. Tobias, der ist mit ihm zusammengekommen, ist verletzt. Und uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I'm with Greg. I don't know what she's saying, but Michaela, if you see this, I will appreciate any translation you might provide. Nils aus Sieke muss mal unbedingt ins Büro kommen. Tobias, der ist mit ihm zusammengekommen, ist verletzt und er soll, seine Freunde sollen sich im Büro melden. I don't know, it didn't sound good. It sounded like it was maybe like addressing some problem in the crowd. Let's give her a big hand. I'm sorry, I don't know what she said, but... Something about beer, more beer or something? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't think so. It's funny seeing what some of these people do with like their 12 seconds of fame when they get up on the stage. Brad, you have been an addict to crack. How do you think about hard drugs today? Well, I, uh... That, what a, like, I get it. There's a bit of a language, like, you know, maybe the ability to be, like, nuanced or subtle with a question is a bit lost in translation. But, like, Brett, you've been an addict to crack. What do you think? Like, it's such a, like, hilarious lead into a question. But yeah, you know, I am remembering now that like, I think he had actually just gone through rehab at this point. So again, I think he would have to go back to rehab in like the 90s sometime. And that was partly why he stepped away from the group. Although I think there's some other reasons too, including his contentious relationship with Jay Bentley. But um, yeah, I think at this time he's actually like, he's gone through rehab. So um, he may be sober at this point. But again, it's, it's definitely something that he struggled with in life. And he's, you know, given candid interviews about.
Brad, you have been an addict to crack. How do you think about hard drugs today? Well, I uh, I don't do it anymore. I think um, I think crack is probably the the worst poison that has ever been introduced uh, to to uh, to human beings. I mean, uh, I think it personally, I think it's worse than heroin because I I experimented with heroin uh, quite a bit and uh, alcohol and um, although I guess it depends on the individual. I will say that I'm not, I don't want it to sound that I, like I'm anti-drug because I'm not anti-drug. I happen to be a drug addict and when I take a drug I can't stop. I, and I th and um, Yeah, it's like it's more about behavior and not about like actually what the substance does to you i do think the like feedback status of the mic here is unfortunate like the moment he leaned the mic toward him it just the the feedback sound got intense or if i have a drink i continue drinking until i black out so i had to stop uh but um i think that uh part of that has to do with my uh perhaps my environment, but I think a, a great deal of it has to do with um, genetic physical causes. I think the central nervous system of a, of a drug addict and an alcoholic is different from the central nervous system of a non-drug addict alcoholic. And in fact, uh, medical studies have been done, they've done research on the spinal cord of um, drug addicts and alcoholics, and they find um, genetic differences between them, so that there is some kind of inherited trait. and. Um, so what I think is, if you can handle it and you can use it, drugs can be good. They can be good to relax the atmosphere at a party. LSD can be very good to expand your mind, you know. I, I love LSD, I just don't, I just, and I don't think LSD is an addictive drug, personally, but. I was just going to say, you know, without, like, um, uh, spilling too many beans, I'll say that in my teens and 20s, I also experimented not as much and with as many things as Brett, clearly, but it was with hallucinogens, and I'd say, like, I don't, you know, it seems impossible, surely, to be addicted to hallucinogens, not only because the experience isn't something that is, like, just pure dopamine release, where you can just keep doing it, doing it, doing it, and it would continue giving you the same experience, um, but it's also, you know, psychedelic experiences are, like, their journeys and you know at the end of them it's sort of like okay like well i need to think about that i need to take some time whatever so um i was gonna say exactly what he was that like certain types of uh, chemicals that people use to um you know get high or you know alcohol to get drunk um i can see intuitively why there are problems for people with addictive personalities and behavior but hallucinogens i think are a different a different bag entirely The atmosphere at a party, LSD can be very good to expand your mind, you know. I, I love LSD, I just don't, I just, and I don't think LSD is an addictive drug personally, but I had, I had tried to stop taking crack in the past, and I had tried to stop drinking in the past, and I say, okay, I'll, I won't drink, I'll just smoke pot, or I won't uh, take crack, I'll just drink, and I <laughs> Whatever, th it, the one thing that I decided I would do, I did so much of it to compensate for not doing anything else uh, because that's how I was, that I had to stop everything, you know. But I, I think that there are people who can handle it, and I think that for the people who can handle it, it's, it's okay. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think that um, when it comes to the point where the, uh, the pain of, of using the things are too great, then the pain of not using them, you, then you have to stop. Training 
It's a perfect song. Sonically and lyrically, it's a perfect song. Uh, the anechoic nebula rotating in my brain is persuading me contritely to persist. It's like, I remember when I was like 13, 14, 15, and I was beginning to listen to Bad Religion, and I was just like, dude, like, what the hell? I'm learning more reading, like, lyrics from this band than I do in, like, my literature classes in junior high and high school. Uh, so, yeah, ultimately, absolutely love that one. There, it's probably my second favorite track on Suffer. There's only one tune that I may like more, and I think they play it um, later in the concert. Thank you. A danke schön. I'm picking up German very slowly. Some people just don't have a propensity to learn languages. I'm one of them. And I apologize for it. This one is called, You Are the Government. As a longtime fan and DJ of acid music of different types, I approve of Bentley's Happy Face t-shirt. Thank you. an introduction like that how could we do anything but yesterday which is another fantastic song and one that like it has a bit more like catchy melody sound to it you know it's not in any way like you know proto pop punk but it definitely has a bit more of a like consonance to it than most of their early stuff it's fair to say uh hello Sorry, I'm not sure why that tripped out, but let me do that again. Well, with an introduction like that, how could we do anything but yesterday? Historical nostalgia, man. It just got worse and worse yesterday. The future's been rehearsed. Do 
Well, what song should we chant now? <laughs> How about the forbidden feet? Forbidden. That is also a cool song, but I'm waiting for when. I think they do when in this concert, and that uh, to reveal to the non-expectant uh, small audience uh, is my favorite tune on Suffer. But yeah, forbidden beat is also good. Uh, and give me one moment. I'm gonna refresh my tea while I take this opportunity. Okay. Beat, forbidden beat, forbidden. This one is called Forbidden Beat. Let's just appreciate that line again. My, like, stage hand roadie guy has a Slapshot shirt on, I guess. It's not, like, really in the same font as the movie, but uh, I, that's got to be what the reference is. That's hilarious. No, surely it's a band. I'm not familiar with them, but now that I say that, like, it has to be a band. There's no way, like... It's it's surely got to be a reference to a band. I love my man here is like completely horizontal. A, a little bit better of a reception there. This is like the closest Bad Religion ever gets to being the Dead Kennedys. And Dead Kennedys have a lot of songs where like Jello is in character and he starts the song like as a, you know, a... Uh, uh, evangelical preacher or like in like the the voice of somebody else and Greg does that here with a quasi like televangelist kind of uh, narrative but yeah like I said there aren't too many bad religion songs like this but there's a lot of dead Kennedy songs that sort of have a theatrical element to them <laughs> Because he gave me brothers and sisters 
please give us ten. Twenty, a hundred dollars tax deductible donation. I assure you, your mom's blood will be used to match the Indian radio. Back to zero bucks. Thank you to many other godly services. No longer will you have to on an unmixed hit unless you play a dog and not a dude. Do rhythmic music. Oh, and your mind carries more than going to what we get in this country. I did it. Uh, such an odd and funny moment between Graffin and Bentley. He's like tuning Bentley's bass, but it looked like it was more about the timing, and Bentley looks a bit mystified as to what's happening. Yo, Brett absolutely going for it. I love it. Again, there are certain songs when you see bands live, you could tell they just feel them perhaps a bit more than some of the other songs. And clearly this is one that all the guys are into. <laughs> new song called Continuous Tuning. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know who that, <coughs> excuse me, was that shouted Frogger, but it almost sounded like an audience member, but yeah.
What do you think is more important in bad religion songs, the lyrics or the music? I think it's both. I think, um... Again, like, I don't even, um... It, to, to be able to interview someone in, like, a language that is your second language, that's got to be an incredible challenge. But, like, you know, that's always going to be the answer, certainly for most punk rock bands. I suppose there's some that are extra like um silly with their lyrics but even then you know that would be the nature of the band where it's like oh they're like a comedy punk band like the toy dolls or something so yeah i feel like inevitably no matter which person you ask in the band because again he's um coming from the point of you know he wrote part three but um i don't believe he wrote too many other songs so um you know i suppose the interviewer might expect him to say well i think it's the music and so on but again anyone in the group and Uh, presumably for most bands, it's like, well, it's it's both. Like, with only one, the band wouldn't be what it is. So I feel like that's kind of like a, you're only ever going to get one answer to that question. What do you think is more important in bad religion songs, the lyrics or the music? I think it's both. I think, um, I read, I read, uh, an article with the guitar player from the Smith, Johnny Marr, and he said that uh, Morrissey's lyrics were very depressing and very morbid, and but his guitar was kind of happy. You know, it was kind of, it was easy listening, it was good to listen to. And so with Bad Religion, some of the lyrics are, are really, they're messages and important messages, but if you had them going, and, and then maybe you wouldn't hear the message because The music wasn't easy listening, so the music is important because that's what you're listening to, and then the melody line with the lyrics over it is what you're saying. So I think they're they're as important as each other. Oh, definitely the lyrics, because um, I would say we can't really play that well. Well, oh, it's so funny. Well, I stay corrected, but you know, maybe a drummer is saying, well, yeah, I mean, uh, our kind get replaced a lot, but ultimately, uh, I stand by the it has to be both. Um, but I suppose there are bands, again, where, like, you could say maybe what draws people to them and what they're considered great for is more their lyrical content or more their musical ingenuity and so on. But, yeah, it is funny to hear the drummer say, oh, definitely the lyrics. I could just speak for uh, myself, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the lyrics are the cornerstone of the band. Uh, I think the lyrics are the most important thing. The mu music is good though too. I think the the words are more important. I think the I think the um, music is the vehicle for uh, the words. Right, but that you know, not to uh, critique the man himself, the one of the main two songwriters of the band, but. Again, like without the vehicle, you know, it's either spoken word or it's poetry or it's pop rock or whatever. And don't get me wrong, I love pop rock, a number of different styles over different decades. But um, yeah, it's like their messages hit in that form more than they would in others. And, you know, Greg says as well, it's kind of the, like the sound we do best. And again, I don't think that's an insignificant point in the context of this answer. So again, I'm with Bentley. And people uh, first hear the music and then they'll listen to it again because they like the music. And then maybe the second time they listen to it, they'll notice there's some words there. And maybe the third time they listen to it, they'll try to figure out what the words are. And then... It That's crazy, man. Like, I've talked on my channel in all different deep dives about how when I've listened to music since I've been young, I hear a song, I catch some of the words, I hear it again, I catch a few more, third or fourth time, I can pretty much, you know, tell what's being said front to back, start, you know, considering and ultimately uh, interpreting some songs perhaps more um, thoroughly or comprehensively than others, but yeah, he essentially described the way that my brain interacted with music, although again, I think maybe for some people, um, you know, they try to read the lyrics in the, in the pamphlet or the booklet of CDs and so on, but Uh, again, I would sort of let the music wash over me multiple times and just, you know, start to learn it that way. Because they like the music, and then maybe the second time they listen to it, they'll notice there's some words there, and maybe the third time they listen to it, they'll try to figure out what the words are, and then 
if they then if they want to, they can buy the record and we have the words written down because it's so many long words in it that if you're just listening to it, you probably can't ever know what we're saying, even American kids or English kids. I always, ever since I've listened to punk rock and really ever since I listened to all music, the lyrics have always been what I focus on. I always look at lyrics. I look at lyrics as being able to set apart a, a really good band from a mediocre band. Because uh, with rock music, it's very difficult to show differences in rock music, whether it's punk rock, heavy metal, anything. But one source of sophistication that you can get from a band is how do they think. Let's get back to supper, shall we? Here's a song called When. Perfection, again, it's like the line in Amadeus, it, to change or remove one note would cause diminishment. Thank you very much. Oh. We never thought the German crowds would be so nice to us. We just thought we'd say that. And I bet you never thought bad religion would ever get here. <laughs> Well, we finally made it. What are we playing? People will know um, who have been following my Bad Religion reactions. I've reacted to a few live tracks from Tested, and that's based um, on a 1996 tour they did of Germany. Uh, and it's, again, I think taken from a few different shows. But obviously, once they established a fan base there, it's a, a touring um, circuit that they did multiple times. Definitely another one of their all-time signature tunes. Greg in a no effect shirt. Whoever threw that towel at Pete, like, successfully landed it on his shoulder.
Thank you. This song is called, I Give You Me, I Give You Him, I Give You Him, I Give You Him, I Give You Nothing. This is a one-off title version of the song, I Give You Nothing, but uh, I like how he's included a little bit extra there. I give you him, I give you him, I give you nothing. talks about us and my pessimistic lines. Another absolute killer from the album, one of my faves. So you are again to experience better story and, and we're the only ones who can perceive it. But on the scene of beauty and the story that's unfolded, that's one that deserves praise and ritual. Thank you. We've got one more for you, and you know everyone in this room knows what's best for you. Above us say the burdens, below us say the truth. We're somewhere in the middle, and we're always on the truth. Is someone watching us? This era of Greg's voice, I think, is like the perfect combination of rasp and melody. Like, he definitely gets more melodic over time. And indeed, some of the Atlantic albums in the 90s, which I've listened to less than pretty much all the other albums, including more recent ones when they went back to Epitaph, um, he, there's some moments where he has some really great, like, melody. 
Um, and the early stuff, he has a very kind of like raspy, scratchy voice. And here, like the rasp comes out in certain moments, but he's definitely like more melodic than the early years. So again, for me, uh, it, like this is sort of the golden era of his vocal delivery. for Germany. Thank you. What's the meaning of the bad religion symbol? Uh, the meaning of the symbol? It's, uh, to me, it's just against any established set of rules. And the church just seems to be the, the easiest target. That, you know, it's funny. I... Like, I didn't remember if they asked everybody about this, but as a kid, I sort of understood it wasn't like specifically or at least just um, a symbol rejecting Christianity. Uh, it was a symbol, you know, indicating that large systems of, you know, control and power and so on, that bad religion was against all that. So, again, it's probably the thing like seen with the most controversy, obviously, and like probably the reason none of their releases, you know, would have been. Um, stocked in like you know major kind of mainstream record shops for a long time ultimately again you get big enough you sell enough records you know you'll find your way into shops but um, again it's perhaps the thing that maybe led some people to like you know view them at arm's length just because it's like oh wow that look that looks pretty intense and I think Bentley's response is something like that if I remember it has a you know the uh, Christian religion has a symbol and has a bunch of beliefs. You either they say you either believe it or not. This is the way it is, and that's not the way the world works. So it was just an easy target to use to be uh, anti-establishment. Yeah, it, when it first came out, we all liked it. You know, we were f little kids, and we thought, yeah, this is a great idea. It'll piss people off. You know, when you're 15 years old, the first thing you think about is how can I piss people off? You know. And it's very good. To, it's very easy to piss people off when you're 15, especially it's easy to piss off your parents and adults <laughs> in general. But as you get a little older, <clears throat> I, I'm remembering now too. I think he's sort of like, I wish it didn't lead people to kind of not take a look at our band and our lyrics because it seems so, you know, contrarian. Um, or as I've gotten older, I've looked back on the symbol of bad religion as. Um, still having some meaning but I wish it wasn't so offensive to other people because other people could benefit from the ideas I think that we've laid down um, <clears throat> for instance what we look at it today as is uh, just a symbol the cross is sort of the international symbol as this uh, parking symbol the no parking is everyone in the world can recognize it um, the cross we look at as 
an international symbol for religion. And it's not anti-Christian, it's not anti-Buddhist, it's not anti-Jewish, um, uh, anti it's not anti-anything. It simply is showing, it's our way of showing that we don't like to subscribe to dogmatic ways of life <clears throat> and dogmatic views of life and that religion okay so greg i feel like is like me in several ways one he can be a bit verbose and roundabout in getting to his points even though he's always saying things that seem reasonably um coherent uh and also he occasionally like me because he talks so much kind of gets a dry throat and he has to <clears throat> like clear his throat so uh yeah shout out to my kindred mr greg graffin we don't like to subscribe to dogmatic ways of life <clears throat> and dogmatic views of life and that religion in general is founded in um, in dogma and in restriction of ideas restriction of thought and it's these things and you know it's it's like most religions have the idea that there's a certain set of truths and those are everlasting, unchanging. Like there's no re-examining them. There's no comparing them with other things. There's no independently confirming them. And so again, the idea of just accepting an entire nested set of beliefs that prescribes behaviors and um, attitudes about things without being able to internally question the system is again like when I first started listening to their music I very much got that that's you know sort of the core philosophy at the heart of bad religion that I feel are very bad about religion <clears throat> it's also very bad about nationalistic views it's very bad it's something that mankind as a group is not going to benefit from it's only something that mankind will um, it's something that mankind will, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's something that will instill violence and it will instill fighting and it will instill. It will make us come to harm. I do love, like me, he's like, hold on, hold on. No, let me back up because I actually have a better way to express that point now. And I was like, I was like hoping he would go in a different direction and then he sort of got stuck there. And then he just literally edited, him, him, edited himself. Edited is a funny word to say quickly. Edited it. I edited it. It's something that mankind will, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's something that will instill violence and it will instill fighting and it will instill non-cooperation of different groups of humans. Uh, uh, that was... And, he, and again, you can tell Bentley is uncomfortable with it, but the the they literally just had to cut Greg off because he probably gave like a two to three minute further answer there. Brett made that when uh, we were 15 years old. Brett came up with a piece of paper and said, look at this. And, and we all laughed and said, that's really funny because uh, the concept of, of taking that symbol and putting the no thing on top of it was just, it seemed uh, shocking enough and good enough because it, uh, it, it represented Sometimes people took it, it that it represented that we were like Satan worshippers and that we were uh, not liking God, but it was more against in America is there's too much TV evangelism of, you know, send me monies and God will love you. And it's like, pfft. so that was at the time that was very popular when we were starting. According to Bentley, it's like Mr. Ed doing that like pfft, horse thing, but. Um... Yeah, like again, the the expressions or perhaps particular interpretations of what it meant at the early stages is you know maybe slightly different um, from the different band members, but they're all essentially saying the same thing. So that was one of the one of the things that we still hate the most is is having to pay to be saved. It's like ridiculous. You don't need that. You don't need anybody to tell you that you have to pay money. So that was one of the reasons why we did that. And it's just it's one of those things that. It happened and we took it and maybe it was a really easy symbol for kids to spray paint and it's an easy symbol to put on a shirt and so it became maybe bigger than what it really was in the beginning. It was just a, it was something that we liked and we thought that 
it would piss our parents off or something, you know. <laughs> and and then when the records came out, it just came everywhere. And so then everybody's like, what does that mean? What does that mean? And whatever you want it to mean is, is you know, you, you decide. How's that for timing? Let's go back and a lot of people call this theme song, we just call it Bad Religion. See, my body is nothing to get hung about. I'm no funny just to take what I gotta say, it sounds better in 89 here than it did in the earliest days, which, you know, that's inevitable. They've, you know, continued to mature as a band musically and so on. But yeah, it definitely sounds better than it did on the, was it the first album? Again, for me, it was like 885. And they're just kind of all those early releases are thrown together. So sometimes I don't remember exactly how they're split up. <laughs> You know, I was sort of like watching Greg and his antics, and I didn't even notice. Was that Brett? Like, who went into the crowd there? Clearly, it was like someone in the band went into the crowd. I see. So a guy was on stage. I think um, uh, Jay had turned toward uh, the drum like stage. And then he turned back, not realizing the guy was there, stumbled over him, and they both went into the crowd.
Is Jay alive? Do we need a med check for Jay? See you tomorrow night in Frankfurt. Well, I'm glad to know that if I hadn't remembered, it would still uh, have told me at the end here. I just, again, like, you know, it's uh, it's 89 and it's like underground music, independent record label, like... You know, obviously the production values are low, but it's funny, like, again, it's like something that you would do in, like, you know, a very early, like, you know, Microsoft, like, um, like graphic design program. And to be clear, that's really not me talking crap, because, like, I'm the most DIY guy ever, but ultimately, again, it's just, like, funny to see, because it's, like, you know, in 89, you know, other groups that I've seen are doing things that, you know, have much higher production values, let's say. So those are all the venues, apparently. Okay. And they also played in the Netherlands. Um... I want to know who the mononymic duck was. Well, there you go. And apparently there's like... Is there bonus tunes? No, it's just like literally the the track listing. Well, yeah. Uh, very cool. I hadn't seen that in a long time. I did remember it in parts, but um, even some of the interview stuff, I didn't remember exactly um, how the the different uh, conversations played out. So, yeah, shout out to anyone who watches this. Um, again, uh, the punk rock reactions will continue, but there's definitely some punk rock uh, DVDs that I have. Uh, again, Subhumans. Um, I have a couple more um, Bad Religion ones. I have a Propagandi uh, live performance um, DVD. Um, what else do I have? Um, definitely some other ones. So, yeah, I'll have to see, um, you know, which ones I'll go through, but... Uh, definitely uh, there will be more punk rock documentary material or watch-alongs, including for Bad Religion. So let me know what you think of this, and I will see you next time. Peace.